you boot up Bioshock, you can feel the story grab hold of you. A plane crashes at sea, a mysterious lighthouse, a sprawling city beneath the ocean, hooking the player from the first touch without overwhelming him with convoluted RPG mechanics was key to the success of the game and the skillful ramping up of Bioshock's legendary gameplay. Bioshock has an amazing opening sequence that I can't imagine the game without it, with uh, you know, the plane and sort of the crash. But I understand that didn't come online until like the very end of development, Sean, is that true? We had a couple of really depressing play tests. We had built all these systems, we thought we were doing a good job of like giving basically people a playground to play with and, and things to do. And when we had a play test, we, man, we didn't realize how bad of a job we were doing in exposing those systems to the player because we were so in, you know, in these systems and in our own heads, we had no idea that we just weren't facing them towards the player at all. So a after that play test, you know, we, we took a long, cold look at what we were doing and realized that we had to introduce it. We were confident enough in the systems that they were going to be fun and meaningful to the player, but we really had to think about how we we're going to introduce these systems to the player and in such a way that they would do it in such a way that it fits within the narrative. So we had to integrate all of these things into the story cleanly so that the player felt like it was one, you know, one smooth experience. And I think the zap them and whack them thing was and one the one of those. Two, and the one-two punch. Yeah, yeah. the one-two punch that came out of that. The plane sequence at the beginning, I, I heard a story that like a programmer put that together in like a day or two and it was a, it was a very last minute thing, right? It was, so we had done a focus test and um, we had had, it was one of the most depressing experience in my life because we were very close to being finished and we it was basically giving people what essentially became the demo and people played it and they and it was in Boston and we were sort of behind these glass windows all these sort of Boston guys like ah oh, this is a wicked piece of shit you know they they hated it and they were making fun of it and they were saying you know it's like it's like watching some guys from guys and dolls getting you know beating each other up and it's the stupidest thing they've ever seen and we thought we were in pretty good shape at that point. And I remember the focus test guy was like sort of, sort of like a doctor giving me the bad news. You right. know, Sorry, Ken, you better get your fares in order. Right. And um, we, went, we all came into work the next day and we were like, what are we gonna do? And we're all pretty depressed, but um, I think we started talking. And as we talked, we started thinking about what are they saying to us? What are these people saying to us? What, we think there's something there. Well, how are they missing it? And we decided that there was, maybe they didn't understand who they were and who their role in the, as a character, who their role in the world was. Because the game at that point started with you in the ocean, right. floating in the ocean after the plane crash. And the crash still had, was in the fiction, it just wouldn't it, show. You just didn't yeah. see it. So you yeah. didn't have the voiceover saying, my parents always said I was going to do great things or whatever that. They didn't show the plane crash. We didn't establish a time period. Yeah. Because you know the plane is critical to establishing. You're smoking a cigarette. It's very 1960s looking. Um, the, all that stuff was established. It wasn't established. So we decided we had no time and no money and no. So we sort of came up with a script. We you know we I wrote some lines. Our line I think Nate, one of our artists, recorded the line. Stephen and Sean and those guys got to work on building this very simple sequence, which was the well simple. Um, straight, relatively simple um, yeah. sequence, and then the plane crash actually happens over the a, the di the um, Bioshock logo we already had. Yeah. But I sort of wrote, we wrote a radio play behind that with uh -huh. you know altitude, altitude of the crash, and that I think set the emotional and the people screaming in terror on the plane crash. That set the emotional tenor much better and explained who the player was. And all of a sudden, we released. Then I think the next real encounter we had was people. People on the forums were just like going nuts. And even though the game had, I think, had a lot of press attention, when people finally got to play it and go through that sequence, yeah, I just remember there was this mass sort of excitement around it. And then the game shipped only what, a few weeks after that, right? Or a month or after a, that? Oh, a, few, a week later or a few days later. It's amazing, like now, to, to hear that, like, literally, like a month before the game came out, like, 
the playing sequence came online or something. I mean, it was that late. Right? <laughs> no, no, yeah. Well, we saw it go through certification. And all yeah, that. yeah. So, but, I'm sure, but it's yeah. like within. You it, was, know. it wasn't far. It was. No. It wasn't far. It was really last minute. And it was one of those things where like you really shouldn't be putting in content that yeah. late. Yeah. But we, but we felt it. We were so close to having something good that we just rolled the dice on it and um, we worked really hard on it. Like yeah. it, we had, we worked really hard. I remember how much time I spent on just that recorded of Altitude. Altitude, I can still hear yeah. the different version of that in my head because we spent so much time on that stuff and these guys were working on and getting the, uh, the, the, the animations right and the... The scene <clears throat> was shot in Engine, but we decided to pre-render it so that we had to do less QA on it. Right. There oh, was really? no, it wasn't going to be some like weird streaming error or crash error. Wow. It was just like, so we're just gonna show the video, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, because once you start in the ocean, the, we had this experience of testing a lot, but the water effects and how beautiful St Steven's water effects were, people didn't realize they were out of a cutscene cut at that point. Yeah. And so right. they would just sit there and stare, and then right. they, they pick up the controller. Yeah. yeah, and they pick up the controller, and all of a sudden they realize they were controlling things. But, they, but that, yeah, as Sean said, that part of the plane is not actually interactive. It was done in the engine, but we, we just filmed it. Now, as you, people were playing through the game and you were testing it, I'm sure, there was debate about you know when would you introduce this plasmids or what would the ramp be? Did that change at all? Sort of as you got towards the end of development about like oh we're going to give people the gun at this point or it's like we're going to trigger these plasmids at this point? Like how did that work? So like we moved guns around like a for instance there was a big debate about originally you found a gun in the lighthouse a pistol in the lighthouse oh, at the very right beginning. there yeah and because it's a shooter right like what the hell and we had a lot of debates about it and I feel that it was important that we didn't do that because the fact that you sort of go through a lot of the experience without being having the distraction of a gun is important to getting you immersed in the world because you know when you when you have a uh, all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail right but you don't have the hammer so you just sort of had to take in the world and have that feeling of fear and um, like I know when you saw that splicer bounding around on the ceiling that you couldn't do anything about it and that had, had even though that no, those are those moments right like I remember yes. my Played Unreal for the first time, where it's like you're you're trapped and there's a monster and you can't do it and the lights go out. It's like th that's the moment with the splicer where you're like, I want to do something, but I can't, I can't and that yep. evokes an emotion. It was a real, it's it a, I mean, it's a real fine tuning process. Yeah, and it gave us an opportunity, like especially with the shotgun, to to really present the weapons, like put some space between right. them. It's a I think, moment when you finally... Yeah, I think yeah, like we get Paul, the shotgun Paul sequence. Paul Helquist was, yeah. yeah, he put the sequence together for the, um, when you see the shotgun laying in the pool of light, like every, every game developer knows what that means, you know. You know the minute you pick that thing up, something's going to happen, but it was still a very effective way, as I'm remembering it, to, oh, look, I've been waiting for this thing, I'm going to pick it up, and now you have an immediate opportunity to use it, but, you know, at the same time, we're trying to ramp up the tension level by having the splicers kind of on the outside of, of the light so you can't really see them and then coming in one at a time and attacking you. Yeah. And we had very little, actually very few tools to really control how they, the splicers acted. So how they were set up and how the environment was lit was really important. You know, those well, there's even other things like when you get the TK plasmid. I don't think we had a lot of physical space and opportunity and time to really present that. So we came up with the narrative that you know, it was the doctor's office and he used TK to practice tennis. And we had the turret in there that threw tennis balls at you. So if you wanted to, you could catch the tennis balls and throw them, and you could knock things down. I think it revealed uh, pickups that you could then, you know, pull to yourself with TK. But we're always trying to think of like little backstories that we could do. It doesn't have to be as involved as as the shotgun ambush. Sometimes it's just oh, let's take a grenade turret and turn it into a tennis ball because, turret. Because we wanted, <laughs> yeah, like, and because I, I remember like the impulse was, you know, I've been to dentist office and there's always some like weird aspect of the, the dentist personality they always want to get through their office, you know, yeah. they just have to have their hobby right, featured right. in some way. <laughs> and so we saw an opportunity there to both feature this, he's a tennis nut and teach TK at the same time. And the Rapture is overflowing with memorable locations and set pieces. In developing a world that feels organic, lived in, and functional, a rational managed to create a space that feels perfectly suited to the story and action that takes place in it, which begs a question, did the plot shape the location, or did the plot fit squarely into a world that was already established?
Let's talk about some of the areas in Rapture because it, it's an amazing place, but also it, it feels like there's certain areas that are very well designed and that they have, you know, a very certain aesthetic and the characters in there, it all kind of comes together. So Ken, do you have a, a part of Rapture that resonates the most with you still to this day? I think the opening is always going to be the most important to me because it's, um, we spent a lot of time there and it was all for me as a challenge as a narrative guy is sort of how do we set up a very complex series of events and a very complex notion and this all this you know Andrew with so much to tell big daddies and little sisters and Andrew Ryan and the time period and and do that all without cutscenes and especially I think the descent to rapture when you're in that when you go in the bathosphere you know getting that right getting everything right down to the you know this the the bathosphere cresting the hill and seeing the city for the first time remember how much we worked on the timing of that just getting that and it took us forever to figure out that we should just put the slide projector covering the window. Like uh -huh. again, in hindsight, it seems like such an obvious choice, but we were really trying to figure out like how are we going to tell this story of Ryan, and then whew, reveal just so you can see the you know the city beyond the hill. And also, we didn't have to show the whole transition going down yeah. the bottom of the ocean because the whole screen was covered. <laughs> Spoiler alert! I think that's the part that will always be near and dear, near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was Kashmir. Yeah. Um, that was one of the first. The, re the restaurant at the beginning. Yeah, the restaurant at the beginning because it was really like the first art box that we created that was Rapture. I mean, we created spaces before that weren't really hitting the Art Deco look. Scott Sinclair had just started and he, he built that uh, design and built that statue of the Atlas with the, um, the world on his shoulders that was in the middle of the room. And uh, Mauricio uh, had done some concept art for us of, of that space. And once we started putting everything together and getting it into engine and actually walking around it and seeing those giant windows off to the side that had that just showed the seascape and really drove home the fact that you're underwater. We weren't getting it right. And so Mauricio did that concept drawing. Yep. We worked really hard on that statue. And that statue, I think, was the first object we really built in the game that yep. was a Bioshock. So we just stayed in that room for like a month until we got it right. And I think the original concept actually had a tram Yes, running through it, it so oh, wow. it was like even more complicated and that was one of those things where we had to keep pulling back and pulling back to really focus on what the bare essence of that room was. Were there parts of Rapture that you never were able to realize that you sort of still the zoo. Right? The zoo, people we had a zoo Frolic, right? that I was excited about. Not everybody was excited about the zoo, but I don't know why I was excited about the zoo because it would have been cool. a nightmare. We had another area that was prior to Arcadia that was more of a straight up uh, agriculture, forest type of area. Before we had the bathospheres, we had a whole sort of subway transport system in Rapture, which we spent a lot of time thinking about, and then just realized that these little submersibles would be a much better, much more realistic and much better solution. And you were going to be able to move between locations in that subway system? Yeah, much like much like much like the um, much like the bathospheres, but they were much more integrated throughout the space, and we yeah. really want to support them. And we just realized it was not a, it was not, yeah. it was not really relevant to what right. we were doing. Were there certain locations or areas where you knew a certain narrative point, you know, needed to happen? Like you look at, uh, you know, the reveal of sort of Atlas's true motivations. Like was that like, oh, we've got to do it this part, this level, because it fits the story? Or was it more that you sort of like, you had the game laid out in a certain order and you just layered the story on top of it? I think the big one I can think of is that you encounter Ryan in his sort of like, that he would live in an area of industry. Okay. You know, so he lives in this very industrial area because that's where he would feel most comfortable. Uh -huh. um, and that we wanted his, his office, his lair to sort of be not in some, you know, residential zone, but right. where he wants to wake up and smell the grease fires and, you know, and the, and the, and the machines and the smoke. That, that's, that's in his lifeblood. Industry is his lifeblood. But it also had to be very theatrical. Like if you look at it, Right now, it doesn't look like an office. You kind of know it's an office because it's the story is is right. telling you that. Set, yeah. um, and we had some old technology that was laying around um, in the game that would control environment settings. So we, old system that we had would cause let you do high pressure, low pressure, medium pressure, and those would affect lighting and um, other like post process things in the world. And that was a system that was cut, but because the code was in, we were always trying to figure out ways to use it. And one of the ways that we used it was in 
the Andrew Ryan sequence because we didn't have a lot of narrative changing. So, and then the preset atmospheres come in and, and shine the spotlights on them or bring up the house lights when we need them to. Very, very early on, you could change the pressure in the areas and that would change how explosions work and all this stuff like that. And we just couldn't figure out how to make it gettable it back, for yeah. the player. We couldn't make it feedback, but we still had all those. That, that moved a lot of levers in the game, so we still had the system, so we used it for the sort of theatrical cues of the, you know, very theatrical cues of Ryan appearing, the lights going down where you are and the lights coming up where he, are, uh, where he is, because the engine didn't have those tools by default. An assassin has overcome my final defense, and now he's come to murder me. In the end, what separates a man from a slave? Money? Power? No. A man chooses. A slave obeys. And there was a great sense of sort of artistic progression as you went through the game too, and that you know each level had its own sort of voice. Was that something that you know a lot of games as they move further in development, it's like oh we sort of ran out of time. We can, you know it's like we're just going to sort of repeat this and change the color palette. It felt like I mean for the team it was very defined from early on that you wanted each each sort of level, which they were levels back in the day, to feel distinct? Yeah, I mean, we had a, we had sort of um, experimented with that back on System Shock 2, back when every Doom level looked pretty much like every other Doom level, um, because they were just sort of working on the same set of assets. We decided with our very rudimentary tools in System Shock 2 that we would progress with color, yeah. and every deck would feel different from a color standpoint, even though most of that was lighting, not or textures, nothing really more. Yeah. But we had the tools to actually, you know, sort of theme levels. I think a lot of this goes back to, I think my first memory was actually from when I was one years old at the Montreal World um, Expo. World you remember Fair. when you were one? Uh, well, I remember being at something at this World's Fair, which I didn't realize I think was in 1967 when uh -huh. I was one years old, uh -huh. a little over one years old. Wow. And I was on a theme park ride that they had with a, and I remember being at this thing where a big bat flies out of this sort of Thing and comes up. I don't know why I was a one-year-old was on this ride. I'm not sure. It's sort of a haunted housey kind of ride, and I, I remember loving it. And I think that stuck with me. So the notion of sort of theme parky themes and settings, um, and Disney World does a great job with this. You can go to Disney World. They theme areas. So themed areas were something that always resonated with me. And Bioshock sort of always has had this notion of feeling of theme in different areas, much more than the real world has. Like you walk from building to building, most then you can't really tell them apart. You right, walk from there, a, yeah, you know, walk from a floor of an office building to another floor, it's not gonna look any different, but we- Dense levels that we ship, but you were trying to tell a specific story with that. And going straight into Bioshock and using the same exact engine that we were using, and we were very comfortable at that point with how the engine worked and how to art up these rooms, gave us a leg up when we sat down and really thought about what stories are we specifically trying to tell. And one of the one of my favorite anecdotes from this time period is um, with Sander Cohen. I think it was Nate Wells and Stephen Alexander sat down one night, and they came up with a backstory for every dead body that you find in that in that space. And then they told that story with the props that they could, even if it was just like this guy crawled three feet and then shot himself in the head because he was sad about something. You know, they put those marks in, maybe put a picture next to the guy, and then he shot himself. So they they really like did their homework and tried to add, you know, the backstory for everything that you're going to find in that space. I've got Atlas's goons hitting us non-stop and two dead mechanics just this week. We need to control costs. If I wanted to deal with amateurs, I would have stayed on dry land. Iconic and haunting, the Big Daddy and Little Sisters of Bioshock immediately captivated the public's imagination. Big Daddy encounters defined the Bioshock experience, creating new mechanics and techniques that had not been seen before in gaming. So Big Daddy, Little Sister, such an iconic moment or series of moments in this game. I'm, I'm fascinated about how that got layered in because we talked a lot about the setting and the tone. That is still to me, you know, a mechanic that I remember was very unique about, you know, choosing to engage the Big Daddy and being a fight that you know is going to be very aggressive and different than a you know, traditional boss fight. I know you had an idea, Ken, of sort of three different types of AIs interacting in the same world. Yeah, we were sort of like, trying to, I was trying to think of like 
AIs you hadn't seen before. And this is still pretty early. Like, like 10 years ago, a lot's changed in 10 years. So like AIs were still pretty much enemies who saw you and came after you. Zigzag, shoot. Yep, and then that was really the focus is how you make them, you know, use AI better at you, you know? Where, so I started thinking about other more primal behaviors to think about. And I was watching a nature show one day you know, these typical nature shows, and it's like the, watch the, observe the mother tiger taking care of her young, you know, one of those kind of things. And I realized that we don't even need a narrator on those shows. We understand certain behaviors just by looking at them. They're very primal, like somebody protecting their young, the predator prey behavior, those things were very, you don't need dialogue for that. And AIs at that point, we didn't have the ability to do a lot of sort of, you know, smart AI. Yeah. So I said, well, what if their behaviors are just very primal and we can we can model those behaviors? So aggro rules is something we knew we could model, right? You know, how does an, how does an AI aggro on you? What are the rules for that? Could they make a uh, aggression display um, rather than just attack? And um, and can another character appear afraid and, and hide behind the skirts of another character? And we started talking about these things. And the Big Daddy became very quickly, the actual form of the Big Daddy became yeah. very quickly as sort of this protector creature. The little sister took a lot longer, ironically, even though it's a much simpler notion in a lot of ways. The initial idea came out of sort of watching a nature show and we're trying to work within our constraints of making, we didn't have, we couldn't make super complex AIs. this entire system set up that completely simulated what would happen and you'd play through the vertical slice and you walk into a room and everybody's dead because the system would work perfectly and right. you weren't, the you weren't there to see the they, fight yeah and, and we track all the well, they weren't called little sisters at the time but they we track how much they were harvesting and it was all like a command and conquer level simulation yeah. Yeah. and players didn't care or notice yep. yeah. and so we just abandoned all that stuff yeah, so that, that took us a step towards, you know, how do we present this to the player, then how do we make the the gatherers, which were, we called them at the time before the little sister design came on, like how do we make them empathetic towards the player, how do we make the player want to engage with that, because at the time they were just slugs. Right. So, which is That's a horrible right, design. Sister originally were slugs, right? Yeah. Actually which is a horrible design in so many ways, because you don't care about slugs, right. and they're also on the ground, so you don't see That's them. Right. They're not like at eye level, and they're dark. So but it you was, still have yeah. something, we still have the, the trailer had like the same, or not the trailer, the demo, or prototype we did, so it had the big daddy sort of like interacting with the little yeah. slug. And well, slugs crawl around the big daddy? Or no, no, it's just, yeah. it's, it's this awful That's little, little mesh. Right. It. Yeah. It's like a little beetle, sort of. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, would, it was terrible. Yeah. And they were protecting, and they had, um, protecting the beetles. The beetles? What? And, no. and, and, and the it big was daddies so had two drills. It's they didn't have a hand, so they could, there's no way they could right. like... Mm, <laughs> it's just yeah. fascinating to me because like the little sister, it's like there's such humanity in it, which really you really connect with. You which would, seems like, like you would think that would be the, the obvious thing. Yeah. 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 We're not very smart. <laughs> the, the idea of sort of choosing to engage the big daddy, I mean, when I was first time I played the game, I mean, that was always profound to me because you sort of sit there and like, am I ready for this? And your choice to sort of like, you know, the kind of opposite of stealth, like when you want to be discovered, was that always the mechanic with the Big Daddy? Yeah, that, that was, yeah. The, the idea was that they would have very particular rules about engaging with you that were entirely dependent on how you, the threat level towards, not them, towards the their creature they were protecting. Yeah, that was set and then as you worked through it, I'm sure there were conversations about how difficult do we make these fights and sort of the, the balancing of that. And even, you know, with the game, you, you don't start off with a big daddy fight. It's a little ways into the game until you actually get to that. So was that, that was sort of debated. You well. actually encounter the notion of big daddy and little sister many times before you actually are freed into an arena where you can actually fight them. You yeah. see them. Sneaking you, out, yeah, pipes. Yeah. You go, you're going, you see them, you see, you see them walking down a hall, you see, well, the first time you see a little sister, she's harvesting, and then you see the big daddy come in and protect her. And we realized it was, it was four or five sequences we had to do to set up, set the stage for these characters. And look, we were hoping they'd be iconic, have an impact that we really, just as easily could have turned out that nobody gave, nobody I cared. I think the actual very first time, and not a lot of people see it, there's a little sister in the vent in Kashmir restaurant uh -huh. That if you're looking in the right direction at the right time, you'll see her looking at you, and then she'll disappear. It's just a set of eyes. Yeah. Just the eyes. No, right? it's, a, it's the actual mesh. Is it the mesh? Because it was easier to do that. Right. Than <laughs> eyes, but yeah. No, 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 no. Thank you. The path of death 
is not always easy. The thing as you play through the game, uh, you know, I think the moments with those sort of encounters certainly stand out to the, um, to the player. For you guys, as you were developing it, was there a debate about how often to sort of have those encounters? Like, you know, like how many big daddies would there be? How would that play out? I mean, was that something that sort of changed as you? No, I think we decided there would be three. I think it was three per yeah. level. So three and two in smaller levels. We did have a third big daddy that was mostly finished, but we we couldn't make it fun. Like that last 10% of an AI is always like, uh -huh. where's the fun? Like, you how do you really make it, they put it in the I think they put it into Bioshock too, didn't they? They might have, yeah. They might have, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it was fully rigged, fully animated, but it, we just didn't have the the time we needed to really, really polish it, so right. we ended up shipping with the, the Bouncer and uh, Rosie. Hunting the Big Daddy, that demo was a, a huge moment, I think, in the game's kind of marketing campaign. Um, and that really, I think, you know, sold the, the tension of that, that battle. When you showed that, did the entire game feel like that, or was that really more of just like a vertical slice of what you wanted the game to feel like? That at that point was more what we wanted to feel like, because the Big Daddy was still had a lot of problems at that point. Um, but we were confident we could do that. Like we wanted to make sure we were, that was an experience we could deliver on. And there weren't, it was like it functioned, but it would do really weird things. Like it had this tendency at the time to if you did the wrong thing, that it would turn into basically a Super Bowl, and start, like a tiny little Super Bowl. Uh -huh. The Big Daddy would go, whoop, Turn to a Super Bowl and start bouncing or off off the the ceiling and walls like a million miles an hour. We didn't, uh -huh. I don't, do you remember why you did that or what I was am going sure on? I'm sure some physics bugs that we, yeah. And, and so that actually happened. Sometimes we were doing the demo, and Joe uh, Falstick, who was the guy running the demo with me in Barcelona, was very good at making sure that he turned away from right. the Big Daddy. Like, oh yeah, I guess we killed the Big Daddy. He must be dying exactly. over there. But so it, they were, all things were functional, but they were they weren't really they didn't have all their bells and whistles on yet. It was really good for us because we it sort of gave us some confidence. It gave us confidence, but it also gave us a tool that the development team as a whole could gather around and say, we want to make it like this. Like, yes, a lot of elements in that demo were scripted, but they provided a framework for us to go back and how do we make that so it's not scripted? How do we make this robust enough so that the player can actually use these systems? Yeah. So it was something that we could point to and say, you know, all right, how are we going to do this? Like, let's break it down and let's let's figure it out. Yeah, and that was like in September, and actually we were, the game was done in the game was done in February, March. So we weren't that far off. Yeah, we were all, a lot went into it in in, in those final months, um, but it was a big confidence boost for us because we thought it was the most important thing about the game, besides the world, was this sort of big daddy little sister concept and. If people didn't care about it, it would have been a problem for us because we spent a lot of time on it. To kill, <coughs> uh, excuse me, to harvest or not to harvest, the moral dilemma that follows you throughout the Bioshock experience and defines the fate of the player. This choice lays at the center of your Bioshock story and has repercussions that can be felt in nearly every facet of the gameplay. Part of Bioshock's lasting legacy of course, are the little sisters and this moral choice that presented itself to the player. Uh, you know, everyone it became a water cooler conversation about like, well, did you save them? Did you harvest them? That concept, Ken, was that something that came about early in development or uh, that that binary choice? When did that come into the game? When did, I don't remember when. I mean, we had the concept of, 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 of them being protected, but I can't remember when yeah, you actually certainly chose. Wasn't, when there were slugs, it was not meaningful. I think there was... Um, do you salt it? Squat. Do you not yeah. salt it? Yeah. <laughs> there were resources that you could get, but it, there was no choice there, right? It was The choice was, do I want to fight the Big Daddy or not? Yeah. I think once we got into the realm of they have to be empathetic, the player has to have some feeling towards them, which you're not going to get from slugs, right. then we start seeing that opportunity there of like, okay, nobody's going to want to do harm to these people girls or do they like I and mean, do we allow them to it was a yeah we weren't comfortable with it at first when it, well, when it first well, came up that we could uh i think it was important that we were that it was a way to reflect the sort of larger economic questions of, of of a world like rapture where like you know 
where the economy drives everything, are there, you know, where are there any limits to economic decision making versus moral decision making? Because that's sort of what you, you know, the Randian notion is that it's not the role that you don't sort of legislate morality. Let's try to take that to an extreme and see where that ends up. And Little Sisters sort of became that. And in this world, they became a commodity. And the question we have for the player is, are you willing, you know, they're a commodity to you as well, potentially, or you want to participate in the commodification? There was, I think, a fair amount of nervousness internally at the publisher about it for a little while, but pretty quickly they were able to sort of say, look, we, we trust you guys and go, you know, do this. And I only had a few, the press, and this sort of happens over and over again, the games press worried a ton about it and like would wring their hands about it. They ever recognized it was a setting topic, but that it was done to a larger purpose, that it wasn't just sort of like, hey, let's, this is the game where you kill children. And well, I'm right, and that was a sensitivity. I know that like you guys wanted to bring them, and I mean, you, you did some things probably on purpose, right, to sort of explain that this, you know, you weren't, you know, you weren't doing anything vicious to them, right? Well, I mean, you are, you, you do sort of, they do sort of disappear out of you and a, a big slug out of their belly, yeah. you know, comes up <laughs> that you, well, well, we didn't want that to be graphic. We wanted it to right. be very clear yeah. that you were, that you were that killing wasn't yeah, right. yeah. yeah. But it was not, it was not intended to be a, a prurient in right. terms of, hey, let's, you know, this is a simulation of, of pulling a sea slug out of a little girl's belly. But we wanted you to understand the, the, that you were making a very diabolical <laughs> more pact, moral economic pact there. And we think that came across, and I think it came across well enough, and the, I think the test of how well it came across is, I think most people didn't really th thought of it as a, am I willing to do this thing or not? Right. And I, people would tell us stories how like their girlfriend saw them harvesting, and then they, they literally slept on the couch that night. Right. And, and that's, you know, that's an interesting, uh, you know, that was, that was interesting how people connected to a 3D mesh that's really no different than any other 3D mesh in the world. Like yeah. this little, little sister, she's not a person. She's a 3D asset, a virtual 3D asset, right, that has a voice actor connected to it who's an adult woman, and nobody was actually getting harmed, but right. people still emotionally connected to them and made, and, and made an emotional connection. And also, you know, I think when you're playing, you don't really know what the impact of that choice is. Yes. And that's sort of the, you know, the, the curiosity of, like, well, you know, you're a gamer, so it's like, am I going to game the system? Which one should I pick? How does this impact things? And as you go through the game, it's never never really fully clear what that choice is going to lead to, right? And the ambiguousness of that was something you wanted to sort of create mystery around throughout the game? Yeah, I mean, we went back and forth a lot about what the rewards for harvesting versus saving would be. And actually, I think we should have really pushed further that the rewards for saving were much more, much more, should have been much more meager than the rewards for harvesting, just yeah. to really sort of put you up against the wall, push you up against the wall and say, yeah. you know, are you going to stick by your moral guns here? Because you're going to pay for it. Because yeah. that's usually the way life is, right? Yep. It's always harder to take a moral path than it is to take an amoral path. Um, but there's incentives to take amoral paths because it's the easier path. As you play through the game, eventually you get to the ending, and um, as we know now, there were sort of two endings. You weren't in favor of sort of having two endings. Was that in part because, you know, the game is about not having choice, or did you think that, you know, the two endings were, I don't know, like, I, I'm interested for narratively, like, why you didn't want to go that path? It seemed forced, given that the game really sort of almost made a joke, I mean, a meta commentary joke about the lack of agency in right. games. The lack of meaning of those choices, given that the, you have these two endings, I guess you could make an argument that well, you were free, you were given choice of the, you know, when once Ryan's dead, and that's really what it's about. But it, I think we also had didn't really have enough time to um, to execute on those Super Bowl. I was pretty happy with how the the, the happier one came out, you know, with the, the sort of little sister focus. But it's a much more subtle story than I would have time to tell about you, sort of your slow descent into you know, moral chaos and, right. and, and, and dissolute living and all the things that sort of come along with a life that is sort of separate from a moral structure. That's a long story. And so, I mean, you just, 
you were just switching a cutscene. It wasn't like you were doing sort of no. a whole other level that was different no, or something. Sure. So the choice was there's two cutscenes with very tight time and or economic constraints. Or just start a nuclear war. Yes. And that's not, you know. You're that's, a nice guy, or you start a nuclear yeah, war. Yeah, and, and because we had so many problems on our plate, that was something I had to sort of do in the spare time. So I was pretty happy with one, but not very happy with the other. I know you had said publicly before that there was a, another sort of more ambiguous ending that you had originally planned, or what, what would you have done? Uh, th there was a notion of an ambiguous ending, which if I, had, if I just wrote one, I would have found a way that would just talk about the moral ambiguity of the world rather than the sort of, you know, positive or negative because it is such a, look, I, I think we really tried with Bioshock not to sort of make a game about good, pe evil, good and evil. It's really about uh, circumstances and what circumstances lead people to right. and how they delude themselves with ideology to do things that they would think are evil but it's okay because it's for the good cause. Right. And um, that's, um, that's what I probably would have, if I just had one to write, I'd probably focus more on that, uh, you know, how, how difficult it is to sort of align, when, when, I, when you start being driven by ideology rather than being in the moment and thinking about the impact of what you're doing. Right. Sean, you talked to gamers, I'm sure, over the years. Did you ever get a sense of how many people harvested versus saved? And what, was there any sort of data? I mean, this is before the days where you get telemetry and data on like what people picked and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, but anecdotally, it seems like more people saving Little Sisters, oh, although, I, yeah, I have a few friends that were, you know, I just, Harvested every single one. I wanted to see what happened. So, I mean, what what would right. happen? But certainly, for the most part, I I think most people, which I guess is a good thing. It means that maybe people are good at heart. You know, they right. they kind of feel bad. They want <laughs> they they want to save the little sisters. So, yeah, I'll say it. You know, the needle sways towards the green there. Time for bed, bye, Mr. B. Hurry, hurry, Mr. Bubbles. The illusion of choice is a thinly veiled dynamic that drives many single player gaming experiences. And while many developers spend a lot of time trying to convince players that choice is real and authentic in their games, the truth more often is that choice is a superficial concept in gaming narrative. Bioshock confronted this idea head on, searing into our minds a innocuous three word phrase with an unforgettable new meaning, would you kindly. Of course, one of the most memorable moments in the game is the would you kindly phrase and the reveal of uh, you know how that's been motivating the player throughout the entire game. Uh, it's still, to me, one of the you know, most classic kind of narrative moments in games in the past decade. What's interesting about that phrase is that it, it didn't always start like that. Can you tell us sort of about the evolution of sort of the, you know, the conditioning of the player and there was once Excelsior was the phrase once? Yeah, this is, <laughs> I'm trying to recall um, some of this. So I, we had the idea, like, because we had the Andrew Ryan scene very early, and we knew sort of all the events that would happen. There were phrases before there was would you kindly, the notion existed and what it meant and what it was, but we didn't actually have the phrase would you, Excelsior was it for one point, that's probably comes from my, my Stan Lee fanboyism. Was that like so throughout the game it would have been like Excelsior? Just randomly there, say there that. There are some things when you're making games you just sort of throw in as like, we need Sounds something. Cool we need something. Why don't you head over there, Excelsior? And then it sits there yeah. for a year. Right. And then all of a sudden you kind of forget it's not good, right? right. And then yeah. <laughs> until somebody comes along and says, dude. Seriously? Yeah. What, or you meant it to be like a stub in. You never right. meant yeah. it to actually gain traction and then you're like, oh crap. But that sense of, of some phrase or word being repeated throughout the game that you wouldn't really realize its meaning yes. um, until later, that was there very early on. Yes, yeah. And the fact that you would have something that seemed like a non-thing and then came back at you like a freight train later on was always it was there from pretty early. Sit, would you kindly? Stand, would you kindly? Run, stop, turn. A man chooses, a slave obeys. So that phrase evolved, but talk about that, I, you know, the sort of meta-narrative of, you know, being in a game, thinking that you have a sense of choice and making these decisions, but then obviously realizing that the, you know, the player ultimately didn't have choice or was conditioned in a way that they would react to that. Um, that was, you know, sort of a, 
sort of a new idea for a game. Where did that come from on your side, Kevin? Was, was there sort of a deeper sort of uh, you know meaning behind it? No, look, I, I think I was always interested in the concept. You know, whether it's you know Oedipus, not to get too pointy-headed here, but Oedipus sort of thinking he has, oh, I'm going to leave you know this city and go to another city because there's been this prophecy about me, and I'm going to avoid my fate, and I'm in complete control, and then finding out he's not in control at all, to the Manchurian candidate, which is a story I love about, you know, somebody who, who you find out is just a puppet, you know, living a life of a man, and Fight Club, you know, I always love those kind of stories about who am I and what is my agency in this world, because look, we struggle, I think everybody struggles that, you know, how much, how much we really have control over, and how much is, you know, our boss, or parents or whatever telling us what to do. So uh, that seemed like a natural thing for a story. And because it came from movies, that idea a lot, and plays, yeah. I, I don't think it, it was very, there was a lot of, it hadn't been explored in games, really. And yeah. games are particularly interesting, because games. You feel like you, do, you are interacting yeah. with us, yeah. And you're really being, you know, most games, especially at the time, you're really just being railroaded okay. down a corridor. It's very easy to underestimate gamers. And I think probably I did a little of my own underestimation there that they would, it would be a little too pointy-headed for people, but people seem to really engage, because probably, how much control do I really have in this game? Uh -huh. True. And, Sean, I mean, it was also something that, you know, was a great surprise when you played through the game, and I'm sure, even for people on the team, did everyone know that when Ken was sort of doing it, or did it was revealed as people played through it? I think, I mean, at some point, the, the entire team knew. Uh, it wasn't, um, it was something that was talked about uh, with a smaller group before you know, it was bought to the entire team. Early on when you when you heard the idea and you you just kinda clicks, right? You're like, okay, like I totally get this. Did like, people get it? I seem to remember a few people looking at me like I was, I was like a luna, lunatic. Not maybe not the specifics and maybe it, it's the Excelsior or you maybe talking about the Excelsior yeah, 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 time, yeah. but the idea that you don't really have choice and exactly like you said, you you've played through how many video games and everybody's game is gonna end the same way. You're gonna kill these people, you're gonna pass through these checkpoints and you think you have a choice, but the only real choice is to stop playing the game. So the, the idea that we're kind of like taking that on resonated. Now the actual, like is it Excelsior or is it the Latin phrase I forgot or if it's would you kindly. See here's how I remember it and I could be, you know, I could, I could be wrong. Yeah. I could remember being so surprised by the outside reaction because I remember the internal reaction being completely nobody and connected or engaged to it. I mean, we worked on it, yeah. And, and so I was kind of surprised by the outside reaction because I kind of thought it was like, you know, as I said, it's a bit academic, right? Yeah. And and it, well, look, it also could be a function of we're playing well, it close to the vest. I could I could be misremembering it, or it could also just be a function of nobody making the game had the experience of playing it through right. and getting to that so moment. Yeah, that's I mean, like it was revealed to them in advance of really playing it, so yeah. it wasn't that surprise. Yeah, and they had seen it in all its really half-assed, you know, development well, stages and, and along the way. out of order. Yeah, out of order and all and that. And it's not really something you can play test over an afternoon, because it takes a little while to get to that point. You, la you need to lack the knowledge about yeah. what the game is to be able to sort of have that um, experience all the way through. I know you guys have talked about uh, you know the idea of Atlas, the you know the voice actor changing, and it was I guess very important that the you nailed that actor right, and, and you trusted that actor until there was sort of the re the Fontaine reveal and sort of understanding that. Yeah, trust was everything there, right? And so there was something about either the actor or the writing or the accent that just m people immediately said this guy's no good. Right. When the, the first Atlas we had, because you have to trust this guy, and if you don't, there's no trust. There's no, you know, there's no punch in the gut. I think we really focused on making him have personal stakes in the story as well. That he had his family trapped. You know, of course, it was all fiction, right? Yeah. But his fan, he had, he had, he had skin in the game. He, you know, he sort of spoke. Listen, I've got a family. I need to get them out of here, but the splicers have cut me off from them. If you can reach them in Neptune's bounty, then maybe, just maybe, I know you must feel like the unluckiest man in the world right now, but you're the only hope I'll ever see my wife and child again. Sean, what do you hope is the kind of lasting legacy of Bioshock? You know, 10 years hence, a lot of things you guys were doing, uh, you know, or have sort of been become common now, right, with, you know, upgrades and moral choices and games yeah. and whatnot, but it was really pioneering work. Um, a decade ago. When you reflect on it, what do, you, what do you hope people remember the game for sort of pushing forward? For me, it's it's telling a story with the medium and how we used everything available to us to tell that story. Um, we used the environment to 
set up the backstory of Rapture and really create a sense of space, which I think is vitally important to getting the players to trust that, you know, to sit down and kind of like just be in the space and, and let these things happen. You know, even, uh, even the radio logs, uh, the rudimentary animation that we had at the time, I mean, we really sat down with the tools that we had and at our disposal and tried to tell a meaningful story. Maybe not meaningful, but something that would be memorable to people that they could take away and, like you said earlier, have that water cooler moment where they're excited enough to, to talk about it after they've put the controller down. So for me, I, I think the legacy is that um, it was a story well told. For me, it was a sense of place, being like the rapture is a real thing, even though it's not. You know, it's actually a very crude, you know, the, from the time, you know, we're always a big crude bunch of polygons and texture maps. Yeah. You know, it's only, the original game is only in 720, I think. And I played a lot of it when we were testing it on a 14-inch, on a like, you know, uh, SD television. That it still felt like a sense of place in the music and the, and the characters. That it's a real place. And I think that my memories of the Bioshock games is that I take away that Rapture's a real place and Elizabeth's a real person. Those are the two sort of big things that stick with me with those two games. And that's sort of what I'll always, you know, carry forward with me in my life. Bioshock is, you know, it's a place, but as we saw with Infinite, I mean, it's an idea, and it's a sort of a type of game. I think a lot of people say, like, oh, this is a, you know, a type of experience. Um, when you think about, you know, your career, where you guys want to go, I mean, do you, that idea of those types of games, do you miss it now that you've sort of moved on to other things now, or do you feel like it's sort of, you've closed that chapter? I mean, it's always a part of what you do. Like, System Shock 2 was a part past that and trying out new things. I, I think Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite and even going back to Swap 4, those will always be a part of my experience as a game developer and, and what we're trying to do with the medium. So I don't think it's something that you just draw a line and say, you know, we'll never return because there's always lessons that you can learn and things that you bring with you to the, to the next project that you're working on. Yeah. I don't think the new game is going to, like, people are like, are not going to be surprised that it's a, this game is a new game from us. They're going to see a lot of what we had done in, before in terms of world building and aspects of storytelling. Um, the goal is to sort of, you know, move away from the you really have no choice kind of kind of thing, and that's a very, 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 very hard problem which we spent years working on. But we're building upon a foundation of stuff we've done before, um, just trying to go in a different direction with it. But it's 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 always going to be part of our DNA. The artist would not fear the censor, where the scientist would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well.